Welcome, I'm Dr. Bob Wright, and I'm here today with Steve Baker, Vice President of the Great Game of Business. This is an amazing approach to inclusive business that really allows everyone to have a stake in the game. So we're gonna be talking to him, first of all, about the Great Game of Business, and what this open book management is about and his experience and how he came to love what he's doing. And then we're gonna to get to hear him consult with us a little bit as I'm sorting out how we can apply the great game of business to our nonprofit organization. So welcome, Steve Baker. Hello, Dr. Bob, it's great to see you. So Steve, you're, you know, as, as vice president of the great game of business, um, you are an emissary, aren't you? That's a great way to put it, Bob, because I do feel like I'm kind of the, the tip of the spear, so to speak, for our organization. Um, emissary. I really, I just feel like I got a promotion. This is good. Um, yeah, we're on a mission. And so an emissary would be exactly what I am. I mean, we're trying to transform 10 million lives um, by giving people a chance to, you know, to play the game that the the wealthy and the influential are playing every day. And we just teach them the secret language that separates the haves and half not. So, yeah, I mean, I've been on the road a lot lately and I've been doing missionary work. Yeah, emissary, I like it. <laughs> okay, hang on. So you just made a big statement here. Uh, what the wealthy normally get to do, we want every man to be able to do it. Now, what is the it that every man is now able to do through the great game of business that only the rich, famous, and powerful were able to do before? Well, so I know that you are a uh, not only a practitioner, but, but also uh, a researcher, an academic. Um, you are, what I've always admired about you, you're like the psychologist's psychologist. I think that's like a whole other echelon. So I was doing some layman research, right? Looking at happiness and that sort of thing. I will get to answer your question, by the way, Bob. <laughs> no, this is good. I love it. Don't worry. Um, and I was trying to find out like who's got the definitive answer to happiness because there's so many books out there and so many um, uh, people have done research. But I finally found there was a um, University of Michigan researcher who uh, came up with like the one predictor of happiness, the number one predictor of happiness wasn't uh, a new job, uh, a trophy spouse, uh, you know, a private jet, all that sort of thing. It was a feeling of autonomy, of control over your own life, of agency. So personally, I can remember when I was 16 and I got the keys to my mom and dad's car and they said, okay, just be back, you know, by midnight. And I remember I had the windows down and I was hooting and hollering all the way down the street because it was the first time in my life I was actually free and it was just me, baby. I mean, I remember that. A lot of people never feel that they're in control or that they have any freedom. And all I want to do is, wow, if someone could have told me that financial literacy and, and, and having a little bit of business acumen, understanding how money worked, how the system worked, would have given me so much freedom. It's incredible. So I'm hope, I hope I'm answering your question in that roundabout way that I'm so good at, which is what if we could teach people? Uh, the fact is, you know what? Uh, Dave Ramsey says money will not make you happy. We know this. It just makes you more of whatever you already are. So the wealthy, <laughs> the rich, that sort of thing. If you're a jerk, more money is just going to make you a bigger jerk. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a philanthropist, if you're generous and loving and it's hopefully going to give you more opportunities. I, I love it. I, I just want to back up a bit. So what you're saying is what the rich and powerful and famous have is agency. They are doing what they want to do. And they sense, a, they sense control over what they are doing. So you're telling me that the great game of business actually gives everybody in the business a sense of agency and control over what they are doing in their own lives. So they have a sense of ownership, a sense of belonging, a sense of meaning uh, and sense of choice that they are where they are because they wanna be where they are. They're doing what they're doing because they wanna be doing it with the people they're doing it with. Yes. So 
in my exposure to you, Dr. Bob, and uh, and your lovely wife and your team and everything else, you know, I just get the feeling that you guys kind of knew where you were going. I've reflected on this ever since school. I had to take jobs for a paycheck, you know, just to protect the four walls, to have babies, to get the car fixed or whatever. And uh, so I had a full 20 years in there before SRC and the great game of business where they pulled the curtain back and said, hey, here's the real game that, that you're playing. So yes, I think that what the great game is gives people an opportunity to take control of their own life, which I think drives happiness. And and so my, I am like reinvigorated. I am absolutely recharged uh, because every time I'm in front of a group or I'm talking to people, I was just with some veterans um, uh, last week that uh, are now entrepreneurs and they are so mission driven and they just want to help people. And they want to make, in our case, you know, America better uh, by creating jobs and creating wealth and that sort of thing. But they hadn't made the connection that People don't want to be told what to do. They want to understand and they want to influence and they want to be a part of something bigger, especially our new younger workforce that's coming in. They want to do good, to do well, and to be a part of something. So talking of agency, Jack tells the story about a time in the early years of SRC where a janitor came up to him and straightened him out. Would you, would you talk about this? Because when a janitor senses control and choice in running a business, that's a cool thing. Yeah, so to set the stage for everyone that's listening, um, we started out in 1983 with an 89 to one debt to equity position. In other words, Jack and the, and the company owed $8.9 million against $100,000 down. They were really in a tough spot. So what he was trying to do is teach people that in order to keep the jobs, everyone needs to understand how we're going to make the bank loan payment. So for a year solid, all they were talking about was debt to equity equals job security, debt to equity, job security. In other words, if we make the bank loan payment, we reduce the debt, we increase our equity, jobs are still here. Because in the late 70s and early 80s, layoffs were incredible. And Bob, you and I remember that, but a lot of our Young people don't. So everyone that's listening, go out, find an older person and give them a giant hug because it was really hard. <laughs> so you're, you're asking about the janitor. So in year two, imagine this. Now people have had 52 weekly huddles, 52 lessons on how the business makes money and generates cash and how every single person is connected to making the bank loan payment. They're all one team united. Jack's uh, getting attention in the press by, you know, because nobody was teaching people numbers back then. And he said, in fact, I was traveling with him a while back and he told me the story again because I was asking for more detail. He says, um, yeah, I'm kind of cruising through the factory, you know, one day I'm feeling good, like the Wall Street Journal is paying attention and Inc. Magazine is sending somebody down and he's got to, you know, just picture Jack and his blazer and his loafers and he's cruising through. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? How are we doing? Are we making the, you know. And the uh, janitor's pushing his broom and he stops and he says, Jack, you know what? I think you're just full of baloney. And Jack stops. You, What do you mean? He goes, all this talk about debt to equity is job security. You know, it, it's just crap. He goes, the thing is, we got 76% of our receivables in the truck market. Well, there's a recession in the truck market every seven years. So you're basically going to lay us off anyway. And Jack is like, oh my God. How does this guy know anything about this? And so like a captain of industry, he, you know, gets his management team together. Did you know that we're so concentrated in the truck market? We may have a layoff anyway. Well, as it turns out, the, uh, the whole conversation was that strategically they had one big customer, International Harvester, and the janitor was just pointing out, well, hey, if you really want to have security, we need to be diversified. Well, Jack did pull the guy's uh, HR jacket, you know, and found out he was a burnt out Merrill Lynch broker. <laughs> uh, Dave Skidmore and Dave actually was uh, really smart. It just no one had ever asked him, hey, what do you think we should do until Jack opened it up and said, here's what we're doing, you know, let's let's do it together. So the, the next thing they did is they started a new division called SRC Automotive, which remanned a different type of engine, automotive engines that that sell a lot when truck engines are down. So the whole thing is you don't know what you have in your organization until you um, unleash it. And uh, sometimes that environment isn't there. So I, I love the fact that 
we try to teach leadership in a way that's, you know, it's about vulnerability and humility and servant leadership instead of just command and control. What I'm also struck by is that we're talking about one team. Yes. Is that everybody's on the same team. Everybody knows the game. Everybody owns the game. Everybody owns the win. And they have responsibility for their own perspective on what I think you call the critical number. That was the debt to equity, was their yeah. first critical number. Yeah, Dr. Bob, that, that critical number, you know, everyone has one and everyone has financials. Um, you have a, a not-for-profit organization. You still have to make money and generate cash because otherwise there's no mission. That's just the way that it works. And what Jack found out so long ago is that it isn't the stuff that we make or the services that we provide. The organization is the product. And so if you're a mission-driven organization, uh, including not-for-profits, uh, it's going to be constituents served perhaps is your critical number. You still have to make money and generate cash. If you're a business, uh, these veterans I was telling you about, a lot of their businesses are, are around, um, let's say uh, defense or government contracts. Uh, one of them paints government buildings, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'm a big believer in supporting our veteran community, um, especially because there's such a, a, a diverse um, uh, group of people, you know, they're from all walks of life, all uh, creeds and and colors and that sort of thing. And and what's great about it is, is they've served their country. Now they deserve something back, in my opinion. Well, the thing is, they haven't put together the fact that this isn't the military anymore. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Nobody likes to have a boss. One team, as you put it so eloquently, one team. That's that's what we should be doing anyway. And leadership should be instead of at the top of the pyramid like a CEO, we should be the trunk of a tree supporting that entire one team, right? We're there to feed the, the nutrients up and the, the, the language and the, the um, uh, education and the support. Well, the thing is very rarely have people, and I'm an example, right? I, it was never about one team. It was, here's your metric. Do what I tell you, punch the clock. Uh, well, hey, I have a great idea. Now nah, we tried that 30 years ago. It doesn't work, you know, that sort of thing. Instead, what if we created a place of respect and mutual trust and the whole thing was built around, you know, our job is to educate you and your job is to hold one another accountable and to, to try to figure things out in a different way and bring everything that you can to bear to, you know, to the critical number, let's say, so that we can move things forward and accomplish our goals. So we've got this, this great game of business. Oh, my God. The great game of business, and 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 everybody's getting into the game. So, what do you see in the? I'm going to follow up on this because I think this is a critical part of our conversation. What's in the way of the rest of the world just saying, "Hey, this is cool stuff. Let's do it." Oh, that's easy. It's fear. People just don't have the courage to say, "I don't have all the answers." They don't have the uh, ability to see that their people might be able to help them. I love how you put it about one team. And, and we have a, a phrase, a higher law of business around the great game of business that we say uh, it's um, uh, pretty easy to stop one guy, hard to stop a hundred. And uh, what's, you know, it's, and it's not gender specific, you know, in the Ozarks, you say, you know, you talk about guys, we're talking about humans, right? It's just people. The thing is that uh, oftentimes leaders believe that they're the only ones with the answers, the only ones with the big idea, or they maybe they don't even believe people care or could possibly learn business. So it's fear, number one, that um, will they find out how much I make? And what the reality is, Dr. Bob, is that it's hard to make money in business and your people don't know it. And I don't mean your people, your people do. In general, yes. But in general, folks don't know because all their information comes from, you know, movies and, and uh, TV shows and the Internet, and it's all wrong and it's all misguided. Um, and, then, and it seems like, you know, there's just a few people making all the money when, in fact, it's, it's difficult to make money. Our backbone in the United States is small to mid-sized businesses. So if we could empower more people to help those small businesses uh, make money and generate cash, guess what? That flows through our economy. It rolls through. It's not the mega corporations that are really doing all the work in the communities. So, okay, let me get back to it. Uh, the reason that people don't do it, what we hear is people will find out how much I make. Well, number one is we don't share salary information. 
We consolidate that. All numbers are represented. Not every number is detailed. The second reason that people um, uh, believe that that they can't share in the, you know, this information or teach their people business is they go, what what happens if if the numbers are bad? Will they run for the hills? Now most people, and I mean, I'm telling you, coast to coast, border to border. I have rarely run into anyone that hasn't said in a situation where things are tough, where they haven't said, well, if I just would have known what to do to help, you know, rather than laying them off, what if you asked them, what could we do? Well, oh my gosh, let's roll up our sleeves and figure this thing out. And the third reason is they go, well, wait a minute. And this came up quite a bit with my uh, veteran group. They're like, I keep training these people up and then they leave for a dollar an hour or $5 an hour or for a benefits package or whatever. And they go, is that what I do? Do I just keep teaching them? Do I keep training them up? And then they leave. And I said, well, what's your alternative? They're, they're stupid and they stay. You know? <laughs> so it's like, we have to believe that people will re respond to the fact that they're being trusted for the first time in their life. They're being treated like an adult and they're being invested in, in training, in experience, in education. And you know what? If you feed me, I tend to feel a sense of loyalty that you can't buy. Did I answer I your question? It. So one of the ways I'm, I'm hearing you is people, you know, I'm driving my car and I've got a, a brake and I've got gas. Yeah. And I, I, I'm wondering why the car won't go any faster. But in fact, I've got my foot unconsciously on the brake, slowing me down. So I'm wasting a lot of energy to get what I'm getting done because I've got the brake on and I've got to pull the brake off to get the full power of my people towards our mission. Yeah, you actually, that analogy is beautiful, Dr. Bob. I might have to steal it from you because in that instance, you're actually destroying the machine that you want to go faster. Because you're yeah, actually, yeah, 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 yeah. your transmission's smoking, your brakes are squealing. It's like, what's wrong with this thing? Well, it's yeah. the same that we do to our people. It's like, guys, let's do it. Here's where we're going. Oh, by the way, yeah, you can't do that. Oh, wait, hold up, hold up a second. No, I can't, I can't get you that. Well, wait a minute. Hey, everybody slow down. Just here, look, stop what you're doing. Here's your quota. Here's your KPI. Here's your metric. Just do that. That's what we do. We slam on the brakes. And we divorce people from the actual outcomes of their daily actions and decisions. And Dr. Bob, when you do that to me, I shut down. You killed the idea factory. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just going to show up and do what I have to do. I, I'm kind of blown away. Hang on. I'm interrupting you here because we divorce people from the meaning of what they're doing each moment, you're saying. and. Yeah as opposed to them having meaning in what they're doing, we divorce them from the meaning and we turn them into basically a machine producing something and we want them to leave their heart behind. Well, yeah, that's what we do is we say, we, we need your hands. Now I'm using that um, <laughs> metaphor so that I can say, you know, we're not after their heart or their head. We don't want their big ideas, but even in knowledge work, we're still using the hands. You know, we're like, okay, I do want you to use your brain, but only the part that gets this code written or gets this, um, um, you know, legal case one or whatever. We're not asking for discretionary innovation, for creativity, because all of that stuff, then I have to explain and teach. And oh my God, that's just a lot. Look, just dumb it down. Here it is. Here's your thing. Just go do that. Well, frankly speaking, we dehumanize people. Um, you know, you said uh, you were you were reiterating so that you could really get the point. Uh, divorcing people from the meaning, uh, divorcing people from the outcomes, right? So part of our great game of business philosophy is is uh, not only to save jobs or create jobs, but it's to create wealth and share the wealth with those who created it. So, yeah, give me meaning, and I'm yours because I know the why. Uh, give me an opportunity, I'm yours because. I didn't have an opportunity before at the last place I worked, but the other one is what are the rewards? What's the outcome? The financial outcome of any action or decision allows the um, perpetuation of the organization. And I believe the elevation and upliftment of humans, right? So, I mean, I want to, I happen to be a guy that, you know, wants to uh, raise a, a family of good people uh, with healthy relationships. And Dr. Bob, you know, I've invested in that and you've invested in me too. Um, and I'm better for it. 
Well, not everybody does that. Not everybody even gets the opportunity to do that. But what if when what if work was a place I could consistently grow, consistently win, and consistently be happy? That is totally backwards of what everybody believes. Everybody believes that we're all working for the weekend, like Lover Boy in 1982 or something, you know. <laughs> So here's where I'm having a, a problem with this. Um, we're talking about a business management system, but I'm hearing transformational leadership. See, there are four characteristics of transformational leadership in Bass and Riggio's landmark research. One is wanting people intellectually engaged. Two is caring about the individual. Three is a vision and meaning that people can buy off on. And four is the leadership walks their talk. Yep. So what I'm hearing is an organizational transformational leadership approach. That's not, it it's is. not the great leader. It's the great organization, the great team, the, the, the great collective. Yeah. You, you, you nailed it. So Jim Collins, way back at, in Good to Great, he talked about, you know, the, one of the secrets of great companies wasn't a, a characteristic, or, I'm sorry, a uh, charismatic leader. Um, and uh, we both know a lot of really great leaders and very few of them are uh, tooting their own horn. It's really about the organization because they know that the organization must be able to sustain beyond the individual. And that includes the leader. So being that transformational leader and creating an organization where we are, um, and, and you know, if I say collective, I want you to know it's not about holacracy or anything like that. I'm just saying it's, it's about we have a common purpose, we're working together, and we get not only the responsibility to make this a better place, we also get the rewards for being a part of it, whether it's a bonus plan or a set of uh, benefits. Um, in fact, I was just uh, uh, teaching on, on uh, a subject of it. There's a cooperative in, in uh, Cleveland that actually helps their people who are an at-risk community. Um, they help them buy their first car. They help them buy their first house. And it's all about the building of that person. They have to take training. Uh, they uh, take the payments out of um, uh, uh, paycheck. Uh, what am I saying? Dr. With, Bob? Well, yeah, withholding. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly, exactly. So the, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the point of the story is that people are so creative in how they're providing a stake in the outcome with people that being a part of the Evergreen Cooperative in Cleveland is about uh, healing uh, broken economies left over from the, uh, uh, the Rust Belt, um, healing communities, meaning neighborhoods and houses and, and uh, apartment buildings that where now people are investing in them, you're, you're healing uh, a broken financial system, meaning that folks that have, you know, probably maybe they're in debt, they have bad credit, you're, you're healing all of these things through business. And what does that do for me as a, as a part of that organization? My God, these are the only people in my life that have you know, poten potentially invested in me or believed in me. And you're showing me a vision I couldn't have imagined myself. Well, that to me is transformational leadership. Hey, yeah, so, so let me let me catch up with this because there's so much on the table we've got right now. So what we're saying is a lot of people think of business as kind of heartless, mechanical, mercenary, don't care about people. You're talking about business as a community healing, as a developmental tool. You're talking about business. So you're not talking about some kind of weird far left horse manure. You're talking about a very central, you know, we work, we wanna make money, we wanna to contribute to our community and we want to make our community better and ourselves better. And so this is also what Senge was talking about when he talked about the learning organization in the mm -hmm. fifth discipline. Yeah, you're nailing it, man. I mean, I, I think that if people could understand that business is not evil, money is not a, a four letter word, um, that being a capitalist can be the most uh, impactful thing you can do. I don't know if you read uh, in the Wall Street Journal this past week, um, Yvonne Chouinard from Patagonia, 
Um, no. Okay, so Patagonia is like the outdoor clothing uh, line, and and they've been around. I sold them when uh, when I was uh, in college. Um, it was just a cool new brand out of California, you know. And this guy Yvonne Chenard was a climber like me, you know. I thought, wow, this is great. Well, now it's it's worth uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars, and he's basically turning it over to a trust, and then that trust will feed out. Um, money to for his in his case uh climate change initiatives what my point is for him capitalism became uh a lever for a, a tremendous cause that he believed in yeah. for the evergreen cooperatives it's about helping people in at-risk communities uh to become players uh in their own lives to have uh agency and control for jack stack in those early days you know he was getting so much press and people would make uh these accusations of, well, he's trying to trivialize business, this great game of business, what a bunch of crap. Well, Dr. Bob, my favorite quote of Jack's of all time is from his original book, The Great Game of Business. He said, you know, I wasn't trying to trivialize business. He said, I was trying to knock it off its pedestal, break down these walls of hype uh, and, and, uh, and craziness that, that basically were hiding the fact that, you know, why does business get to be this elite sport for the select few, keeping everybody else in the dark and out of the money. So I've, I've got a new, I've got a title for this, this uh, blog. It's the janitor as capitalist. Cool. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Because what, you know what, this happens all the time. You really have got me thinking now about all the fun things that people can do when you can tap again, their discretionary intelligence, their in discretionary energy, innovation, creativity. Um, what we typically do is we shut them down. Ah, we already tried that, or we did this or that, whatever. I mean, unless Jack would have created that uh, um, uh, open environment where Dave Skidmore could go, you know what? I think your plan is wrong. I think you need to look at this and we need to diversify away from one big customer. What if we could actually try to tap the intrinsic motivation that people have every day, make the connection that, you know what, we either make money or lose money with each one of our decisions. And then we teach them that that's the secret language. It's the only thing that we've got. Financials are the only universal language that we have that every country, language, culture, everybody uses the same thing and have for 500 years. So there's another element to what you're talking about, Steve. So I had a friend years ago, who had a meteoric business <clears throat> and they were rocking and rolling. They were famous and everybody wanted to work for him. And he decided that they really should have everybody have a stake in the business. Now I'll get to your book and your books about, and you're, you're, by the way, you're co-authoring the reissue of the great game of business, I believe, aren't you? Well, actually, uh, yeah. So, uh, Rich Armstrong and I, uh, help make sure that the anniversary edition had some additional material in it. But we wrote a book called Get in the Game, uh, which is uh, the 10 steps of how to actually do or implement the great game of business. So it's the cookbook for Jack's original. Well, th so that's really a big part of your expertise. But what he did is he divided his business ownership up equally to all the staff. So he was going to democratize business. Wow. How soon do you think they were out of business? Pretty quick, I'm guessing. <laughs> Within two years. Within two years, they were dead. Oh. Because the people who had never taken responsibility for the success of the business all wanted to flap their jaws about what they thought should be done. And everybody was squabbling with power control struggles. But we're not talking about democratizing business. We're talking about including everyone as an integral part of business, consciously engaged in the business of the business from their point of view. And so you start out and you train people in reading financials. You want them to understand the business from where they're coming. Now, I got to tell you, Steve, there's another element here. When I was down visiting you guys a few years ago, and I saw the manufacturing boards, I went cross-eyed. I'm, I th I'm looking at like this higher level math about how everybody's <laughs> measuring every aspect of manufacturing all on one big board. And I'm going, whoa, <laughs> I couldn't get it. 
Well, there's a simple reason for that, Dr. Bob. It wasn't your number. Right? <laughs> the thing is, if you lived with it every day, if you if you actually were educated on something and then you were asked to be an expert, hey, Bob, uh, you know, in our factories, it's it's people turning wrenches. How many of these units do you think you can have done? Well, it depends. It depends on this and this and that. I love asking people to be expert and then keeping track of it all, just keeping score. That's natural. And actually, I'm I'm really glad I never get to talk about relationship scorekeeping. But here I'm talking to the right guy. We we all know there is a secret score being kept, don't we? Right. Because I know that with Joanne, if I um, because I'm a good husband and, you know, if I just remember to do the little things that, you know, everything's good. Uh, it's not big gestures, right? It's a constant communication. And you know what I mean? And it's not like I'm keeping score, but I do know this. If I forget to do one of those things, there is a response. <laughs> Somebody's keeping score. So I'm just being honest with you that say, you know, there's nothing wrong with keeping score. And the reason that you couldn't keep score on their scorecard is you weren't part of that team. But I bet you, if you went to work there, uh, there would be people saying, hey, Dr. Bob, what's your background? Uh, what's your family like? What's going on? Hey, here's what we do here. Let me show you how it works. And every day, as you keep score, you will learn it in the flow of work. So it's not about um, an academic approach, although we are the two, the new teachers. I mean, because people really don't understand how money works. Uh, that's that's clear by looking at the student loan crisis and the consumer debt crisis. But it's really about the comic book simple stuff, not not being accountants, but being business people of we bring money in, we spend money, we have expenses. And at the bottom of, of this whole exercise is, uh, you know, did we make money or not? And by making a profit, we can do things like have a health care uh, program. We can have, um, you know, for us, what I love about it is I have a, a chance at at ownership. Not everybody gets that, but it's an employee-owned company. So I, I'm looking at that and I'm looking at what it costs to get a prescription filled. And I'm looking at, um, hey, if I want to go back to school and uh, and get a, a PhD, they would pay for it. Well, where does that come from? A thriving, profitable, and sustainable business. So let's dig in to another level of reality. Sure. You've got, what, 3,000 some odd people at SRC they aren't all equally invested and engaged. Some of them are heavy duty into it and some of them are less into it. What, what's it like really um, when you've got the whole range of humanity and you're committed to them and how do you, how do you negotiate the varying degrees of commitment to the business? Yeah, especially these days, Dr. Bob, because you got, um, we have over a hundred openings right now. And that is crazy. Between all 10 companies, we need an, another 100 people to deliver on the promises we've made to our customers. Well, everybody out there that's listening can relate to it. Uh, people will be your problem for the next 10 years. That's just the way it is. So uh, we believe that in that time period, in the next decade, the people with the smartest, um, most engaged workforce will win and dominate in their workplace. So when you ask, what's it really like? It is a spectrum and it is human. Oh my gosh, it's so human. Um, the thing is that you will have people who are on fire. You'll have people like me and Charlotte Eckley and my team at Great Game. And you'll have people that are just, they get it and they're on the mission. And you'll have people that are sort of like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Okay, got it. And maybe they're sort of in fair to Midland and you're going to have people that you hired last week or maybe 10 years ago that just are like, look, I just want to do my job. And that's the way it goes. But where do we spend most of our time as leaders? Usually it's the 20 percent that are causing the most ruckus or being the most negative. What if we spent more time on the 80 percent that are like, mm, yeah, it's pretty good here. You know what I mean, it's not that we don't deal with the issues at hand, but. If somebody isn't pulling the wagon backwards, they can turn a wrench. They can do the job. They can punch the clock as long as they aren't being negative and being influencers to the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. So it is a range. It is a spectrum. I'm just looking for more lights to come on. So there's a concept that's a very old concept about pulling your weight. And it had to do with literally pulling things. 
And okay. yeah, I weigh 180 pounds, so I'd have to be able to pull at least 180 pounds. So the minimum acceptable is you pull your weight. You, you earn your paycheck at the minimum level. But some people are going to pull double their weight or even more. Yep. And so you're saying we want to put the energy into the heavy pullers and let the other ones just be what they want to be because we're not trying to force them into a different way of thinking. Um, but we want to find the ones that get the game and really reinforce it for the game. So how do you work that in your compensation at SRC? Yeah, so I would like to clarify something. And it isn't that we just like, ah, you don't want to really do much. Nah, you didn't. I mean, there, the one thing is, when you mentioned the scoreboards in the factory that you saw, when you bring accountability to the front line of the business, meaning your peers are holding you accountable, not just your boss, but everybody is like our uh, stake in the outcome, in this case, a bonus program is team-based. It's not individual. And so you have cultural Darwinism. If you don't want to be a high performer, there's a real good chance your coworkers are going to be like, dude, what do you need? How can I help? Or do you need to work somewhere else? <laughs> because we're on a path here and I want this bonus, right? It's an expression well, of our- Your pressure raises the bottom. I think so. And the opportunity- is the tide that raises all boats. So the thing is, Dr. Bob, this is a performance environment. And I'll tell you something that I feel comfortable telling you. I wouldn't uh, do this with everybody I talk to. But when I first started, oh, again, almost 17 years ago, I remember going through hours and hours of, uh, of interviews. And I just thought they didn't like me much around here. And so I called a friend of mine who knows Jack Stack and and the SRC company, you know, he's an entrepreneur. And I, I'm saying, Jan, um, yeah, this is what's going on. And, um, and, and he goes, uh, Steve, you're applying over at, at SRC? He goes, I don't know if you're going to like it. It's kind of a performance environment. <laughs> I'm like, what? Do you think I'm lazy or something? And that, I think that was something that, that really got to me, like both emotionally and intellectually. It's like, what did you think of me that I couldn't fit it? You know, so I knew coming into it that it was different. It was a different kind of place. And boy, it really is because people expect you to be the best version of yourself, even though you may not know what that is yet. And that's really incredible because we're still a blue collar workforce, turning wrenches and things like that. Well, the thing is that I, we just had our annual conference. You've been to that before. And uh, I was just really impressed by a, uh, a literal frontline worker, hasn't worked even a year yet at SRC, um, but was up on stage with me at the main stage in front of seven, 800 people um, because her and her team had created a mini game that produced like $43,000 in savings. And she was so terribly scared and nervous to be up there. But once she started talking about how they did it, it was transformative. It was like she, when she became the expert, she got to tell her story and she came from a place of power. And it was just like, I was filled with, uh, with happiness and pride and, and uh, just, I mean, it was just so cool because the whole audience was behind her going, wow, she really knows her stuff. Where in her life before did she ever get to be an expert? I don't know, but this is a place where I bet she'll be here for 20 years. So, I'm so inspired talking to you. So I have what we call a hidden agenda because we're still working on our critical number. Yep. And, and you've been very gracious to coach Mike and coach us on, on our critical number. And um, what I'm thinking about right now, whether I can pull it off or not, mm -hmm. is I'm gonna go to our board because be, being a nonprofit and you know, needing donations to exist, we don't have that net that you guys go for, net profit. And so we could talk about a uh, 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 gross profit, which would be, you know, uh, uh, variable expenses. But what I just came to is we've got a design committee working on our next um, critical number. But I just was listening to you about the stake in the game. And I know you weren't hammering it heavily, but I'm listening very differently than most people will listen to you. And what I just started thinking about is the critical piece is 
The more students we have, the more money they spend, the more money they spend, the less we need philanthropy to operate and the more we can use philanthropy to further our mission even further. Mm -hmm. So I started toying with this and I realized that I'm gonna have to go to our board and ask them to help us create a, um, a so what for our employees. And I've been kind of resistant to that. And um, so I, I just hypothetically penciled to myself, you see me every once in a while taking notes down here. That's you're, all across. I figured um, you're analyzing me. What? I figured I, you're analyzing me. No, no way, dude. I got my, my own problems that you can handle yours. If you ever want me to help you with one, let me know. But right now I'm on mine. Um, so I, I, what I'm working on is, is, you know, if we've got 30 staff who are full time and um, if we were to get a new student, go net up a student, 10 bucks be 300. 300 bucks for acquisition of a new student is not that much money. If the lifetime value of a student is going to be 1500, 750, 3000, different times we look at lifetime value differently for different parts of the business. So I believe that we're missing that piece of juice and the so what's in it for me. So as I'm listening to you, I'm introspecting on where as a nonprofit, we're missing the boat. And I've resisted Mike talking about this, um, but it is a loose tooth for me that I'm working on. Uh, and as you're talking, we're going to have the other thing that I'm that I'm getting out of what you're saying that I'm grateful for. So that's just a thing that I'll, that we can set to the side. Uh, I'll handle that on my own here. I've, I've got some reasons to do that. Um, but the other thing I got is that we're too happy to get somebody that wants to work for us. I like this story about how they interviewed you. I don't <laughs> think we're picky enough. I don't we're, think we're picky enough. I think we're too damn eager to get people. I think we're unwilling to insist on having people who have a high probability of wanting the game, getting the game, and being capable of living the game. And I, I you know, they knew they 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 knew they were the game, and they they were going to make you pay in the upfront interviewing process to get in the game with them. Otherwise, they didn't want you. Well, and it's, you know, I, I wanted it more when I found out that it was hard. <laughs> it was like, wait a minute. Now I want it. It's sort of like that exclusive club, you know, that has the velvet rope or something. My old bit. Now you said, you know, people are the issue for the next 10 years. And I believe you. But in my old business, I had in, in the country, we were tops rated by Mercer and Anderson and the top five by Hewitt for a part of a, one of our divisions. And we had, I had pretty much built the business I wanted to build. We would spend three months interviewing a new staff, new, new staff member. Wow. And you know what happened at by month three? Some people got pretty damn testy and we got to see what they were made of and what it would be like to live with them under pressure. Mm -hmm. And we weren't sorry to see them go and go back to stretch to get somebody else back in again. So I'm, I'm, I'm really taking stock of this conversation on uh, when we're advertising and interviewing, are we really vetting people? Uh, and and if, we're, if we're let them in, we need to let them know that that doesn't mean they're here forever. Well, you know, Netflix, um, you love them or hate them, they are a, a very powerful, a successful business and Reed Hastings, the uh, CEO, wrote a book recently called No Rules Rules about his experience there. He credits Jack and the Great Game with being the foundation of the Netflix culture of freedom and responsibility. Well, in that book, and this is where it goes to adapting the game for your organization versus just adopting it, right? Making it right for you. And so a not-for-profit is going to play the game uh, true to the principles but they will adapt it to that environment. What Reed Hastings says is that, uh, and everybody that knows Netflix probably has heard this before, is that you know, it isn't that you're there forever, it's that if you are underperforming, uh, we will try to help you. Um, and if it still isn't working out, um, 
then what we'll do is give you a very generous severance. And it was really great to work with you while we could work together. Because, you know, in technology, it's always up, 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 up. If people aren't keeping up, well, he's got to find the people who will. And the bottom line is, is that I don't know that um, if I wrote code for a living, um, or, you know what I mean? Is like that kind of scares me a little bit. Um, I'm hoping that people who actually uh, develop technology are going, oh, well, that's not unusual because, of course, it's changing all the time. So I read these articles and I go to these conferences and I go get training and whatever. You see what I mean? Constant mm -hmm. improvement. Well, I'm all about continuous improvement in my life. And I think you've known that, you know, as you observed me as I'm trying to, I'm seeking, you know, how can I be better? So I think people want better. It's just that maybe they haven't seen the example. They haven't um, um, had the opportunity. They didn't have the resources. And in the case of, of Netflix, it is uh, um, going back to what you said is that there, you know, life is dynamic. You better keep improving or you'll be left behind. And you need people in your organization to constantly develop, constantly grow. That's what you guys are. To me, you are the growth Institute, you know, what I mean? you're like about growing people to get to that uh, ultimate potential of each of us. Well, if we don't keep seeking it, um, we will suffer entropy, you know, we'll just, oh, okay, well, whatever. And, uh, and organizations do that too. If we don't grow, we die. That's just beautiful. So, uh, you know, I've, we know that you're a great consultant. So, so people watching this, um, how can they get in touch with you? And, and uh, I'm assuming you'll be welcoming them and, and guide them to where they need to go to learn about the great game of business. So yeah. what's your, what's your, what, what's the contact information they need for you? Yeah. So uh, to begin with, I would, I would check out the website at greatgame.com. Um, you can also go to greatgame.com slash Steve. And there's some free resources, a couple of white papers about building an ownership culture. It's a great way to begin the process. And then what me and uh, my team will do, that was probably Ozark's English right there, me and my team. <laughs> um, what we try to do is figure out, help you figure out, you know, where are you in your journey rather than shoehorning you into the great game. We'd rather apply the great game at wherever you are, meet you where you are. So let's get acquainted and and let's see how we can help. So they will get a contact person who will get to know them. Yes. So even though you are the apostle of great game of business, uh, you're really looking to attract the appropriate people uh, and the appropriate businesses for whom this seems like the best fit. And exactly. you'll help people sort that out. Exactly. This isn't for everybody simply because people are different. And if you're courageous, if you're like going somewhere, you're on a mission and you, you know that your people are that untapped potential or that you just don't think you're quite getting it all together, the great game may be for you exactly. I think it's a, if I hadn't been out there in the world, Dr. Bob, with what I would call just regular small businesses for a lot of years, I wouldn't have felt the frustration that that allows me to go, hey guys, this is amazing. And this is the way you can go next level, right? I wouldn't have known. I would have just been like, oh, doesn't everybody do this? But no, they don't. It is a very, very uh, powerful competitive advantage. So they, they go to uh, greatgame.com. Yep. And forward slash Steve Baker. Yeah. So just uh, greatgame.com will get you to our website and there's a lot of tons of resources there um, and uh, easy way to get in contact with us. Greatgame.com slash Steve will give you, uh, I'll just list them off for you. Uh, Jack's original book in audio form so you can listen to it and get inspired. Uh, a chapter, a sample of, of my book, uh, Get in the Game, so you can go, oh, I could actually apply this. Uh, maybe I'll just give this a try myself. Uh, obviously, we'll you know get in contact with you and, and try to help you out. And then there's a number of other resources on there that can help you, uh, like a workbook. And as I said, the white papers on kind of exploring this ownership culture idea. But yeah, greatgame.com 
or greatgame.com slash Steve. Both will get you in touch with us. So we'll revisit this again later on, but I want to start getting down to, you know, there's always, uh, there's always like a, a concentric circles model of yeah. there's the bullseye people for great game. Then there's the almost bullseye, then the almost, almost bullseye, then the almost, almost, almost bullseye mm -hmm. people. So give me the uh, at least three circles out and the bullseye people so they can think about our, uh, where do they land in your experience oh. of, of who it is. Well, I appreciate that. No one's ever asked me that ever, Dr. Bob, in 17 years is to kind of lay out where people are. So I'll do my best um, without over explaining it. To me, um, starting out three layers would be someone who knows there's more. They're like, they, they have a heart. Uh, they maybe they've, um, uh, they're have they in the process of buying the business from their parents or they're, uh, you know, everybody's in transition, right? And they don't know what to do. And, oh my gosh, you know, what? If, but the thing is, what we see is in uh, uh, newer ownership, oftentimes there was, you know, the old generation was kind of command and control, iron fist, do what I say, that's it. And a lot of the, our newer entrepreneurs are saying, but wait, we can actually get more from people if we're nice to them. What the heck? So I'm three, 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 three levels layers out. At yeah. three levels out, I'm buying, I'm possibly buying the business from my parents. And so I'm going to want to get to know more about the game as I get my arms around my business. So I'm not going to rush into it tomorrow. Yeah. So that's three levels. Yeah. Okay. So let's go into two levels. So at three levels out, I'd say, you know what? There's a better way. You know, there is. And maybe it's this, maybe it's something else, but it doesn't hurt to read or listen to the book. Great game of business, right? It's available in all formats, on all platforms, easy peasy. And somebody will go, huh, that's interesting. So that brings you into level two, which is I'd like to just dip my toe in, just try a little bit of it. Well, what if you tried to teach your people how a dollar operates in your business? Or what if you, and this is when people will come to a workshop or maybe, maybe Dr. Bob, they'll try a mini game which is again on that greatgame.com slash Steve, right? It's for 90 days. I'm not even going to open the books. I'm just going to ask people, did you know that if we could reduce rework, it will make uh, for every dollar we save in rework, it'll give us four to $7 in profit. And if we do that in that 90 days, I'll share half of the pot back with you, whatever we garner from this exercise. And so you teach people the rules, you, you, uh, follow the action and keep score with a scoreboard and you get a mistake in the outcome. Maybe we'll have a barbecue or maybe you get a, a t-shirt or something. What do you okay, want? Okay, so, they, so they're easing in. Now, Easy. one level, one, one removed from the bullseye is? Yeah, that would be uh, coming to a workshop, trying to implement, getting in the, in the game, so to speak, where they go, we're committed. We're going to do these 10 steps and it's going to take some time and it's going to take some effort, no doubt about it. And it's going to take some courage, right? Because we we kind of get into conversations where you go, maybe we're not making as much money as we thought we were, because maybe as the leader, I don't even know. <laughs> so know? I've got to be ready to really get to know my business in, out, and not the mythology, but the realities. The realities. The that's right. The then, realities. Yeah. So they may go in, uh, they may come to our conference, or they may go to a workshop, or they may even... Uh, you know, begin the process on their own. The people at the bullseye are the ones that say, okay, you know what? And I think you can relate to this because you guys do it at, uh, at right. And that is get a coach, you know, be a part of the thing ah. because why, why do people come to you and why do they invest in the, in the courses and in the uh, coaching? It's because they go, okay, I know this is making things better. Um, I need to go deeper. I need to get the full on thing, but I need someone who can help me avoid the speed bumps and the brick walls that I'm going to run into on my own. Cause see, Dr. Bob, I will, I mean, I'll just flat out admit it. I'm obstinate. I probably have oppositional defiant disorder. My wife tells me that. <laughs> uh, I probably have um, a little touch of the old ADD. Uh, who knows? I got a whole bunch of letters, right? But, <laughs> I'm creative, I'm smart, I'm pig-headed, and um, when I believe in something, I can be very disciplined. But without the belief, none of this other stuff matters. Okay. So 
a coach can hold me accountable. They can train me. They can keep me on track. You know, in other words, they're the guardrails that keep me from getting in the ditches. Yeah. So that's that's my belief is that the center of it is getting help, yeah. um, working out. It's just a little bit diversion, different version of the help, right? So. Well, and we, we've seen that because you folks training doctors well as a coach has really helped us get closer. I still don't think we're there yet. Now, who, who are your bullseye people? Yeah, those are the bullseye people. And so I, I actually went in one level because sometimes people will come in and do, and you see it too. Some people will do a workshop. They'll do a uh, webinar. They'll do something, you know, they're, they're closer. They're in there. Uh, they may be even doing it on their own, but it be it's the equivalent of me trying to self-diagnose stuff about me or my family. You know what I mean? It's like getting the help. It's not just having the tools. That's that's like ring one. Bullseye is you're in there, you're getting help, and you're getting accelerated because you're deeply implementing the the process and really applying it to your organization. Does that help? Oh, that's wonderful. I, I think it's just so, so important. And so it's greatgame.com. And then if they want more, they do forward slash you, then they can see your white papers and your books and the other things you've done. And um, whether they're, whether they're you know, super excited about it, they got to look at it because there's so many ways to win the hearts and minds of your people that many businesses aren't understanding that you really understand it, the great game. Well, I think so. And if I hadn't been outside first, I wouldn't get it at this level. But I am passionate because I have seen it change not just my life, but so many other lives. And I've seen it create opportunities for people that never would have gotten an opportunity. And I have been teaching my kids, Dr. Bob. I just, I got to tell you, I saw them on the, on the weekend. Um, and it was just so great because what does every parent want? You want pe your kids to be successful and to find love and and to be contributive, contributive. What's the word I'm looking for? You want them to contribute to. Yeah, it's awkward. <laughs> um, right. I mean, it was just like, I mean, my heart was filled because they they like one another. They have found love. They're all talking about what they're doing in the community. And I go now and I feed them constantly like all the stuff I've learned at right I'm feeding them and you know I taught them the drama triangle first off you know it's just like we're not going to be like our other uh, extended family of origin right we're going to be our family of creation and it was just amazing to see well just take the same thing and apply it to business what if you gave people an opportunity to do something and to understand something at a level at which the universe is not I mean, look, the internet's not going to teach you this stuff. It's just not. And, and it goes for the, the things that you teach it right and the things that we teach. I think they're so aligned because it's about if you knew the game you were in, if you knew the rules of the game and all the secrets and the secret language and the secret handshake, would you be better off? Only if you choose to do it. So <laughs> that is it, right? I'm going to give you all the stuff you need. I'm going to show you how to do it. And you have to choose to go for it and then multiply this great impact and this great feeling by giving other people a chance. That is so perfect. Thank you very much, Steve. So uh, I'm Dr. Bob Wright, and we've been talking to great game of business, vice president, author, evangelist for open book management through the great game of business, who is also our advisor in, in great game of business. And um, a really, really wonderful, wonderful real resource for you and your business. So thank you very much. And thank you so much, Steve. It's my pleasure, Dr. Bob. Great to see you.